Hello, it's Evan, and welcome to Boston Virtual ARTCC's final seminar from Ground School 2020. Tonight, we're looking at a really interesting subject that has developed quite a bit over the past several years, and that is RNAV procedures. So we're looking specifically at all the types of RNAV procedure you might see in regular flying from instrument departures through to the on-route environment, and then particularly paying attention to the approach phase of flight and the arrival phase, dealing with descend via procedures, climb via procedures, and all this modern stuff we deal with primarily and predominantly in jet aircraft, but applicable as well to non-jet operations in and around busy terminal areas. It's a lot of interesting things tonight and things that'll be interesting both to people who fly jets on a regular basis on the network, but also lots of great pilot tips for those of you who are in the low and slow and who may not necessarily be flying the RNAV descend via procedures, but like to have some awareness about some good things to keep in mind whether or not you're on those kinds of procedures. So with that in mind, Alec will take us through tonight's session talking about RNAV. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, so tonight's objectives, we are going to provide some background on RNAV procedures. Uh, we're going to talk about the applications of RNAV in the online aviation world uh, with a focus on STARS, which are probably the more complicated RNAV topics available out there. Uh, we're going to talk about different types of STARS, so RNAV versus conventional. Introduce the different phraseology that is associated with RNAV procedures. And then we're just going to uh, discuss a couple examples of flying RNAV STARS into Boston. So I guess the main question of tonight is, what even is RNAV? RNAV as a, is uh, area navigation. It's a method of navigation that permits operation on any flight path within coverage of ground or space-based nav aids. So what does that mean? That means you can basically fly anywhere. Um, there is an increasing dependence on RNAV today in lieu of routes defined by ground-based nav aids. So uh, space-based uh, space -based navigation is becoming more and more popular. And you can see that the red line drawn on the screen uses VORs uh, here, such as tu uh, Tucson and San Simon. And then the green line, uh, you just navigate directly between the two, not using uh, San Simon. That's just using GPS navigation. That's the RNAV bit. So I think most people are probably familiar with the basics of RNAV, but of course, much more direct routings have become available now. In the olden days, you had to follow all these VOR airways across the country. Nowadays, in particular, when it's not busy or if you're in the citation at 45,000 feet, you just shoot direct your destination wherever you want to go. It's totally revolutionized the way we travel across the Atlantic, the way we travel across large areas where there's just no ground coverage. And in addition to that, it's become so much of a valuable tool and so popular that the FAA is basically going around decommissioning almost everything that you see in terms of ground-based nav aids. Wouldn't surprise me if San Simon VOR might have been gone by now. So there's only going to be a limited number of VORs that remain in the country over the next several years, and the ones that are deemed non-essential, so basically minus a couple of VORs around major terminal areas, basically everything is going to become RNAV in the next little while. There's still going to be a safety network of VORs, and that's actually included now in instrument publications. If you look at the IFR charts, you may see MON around certain VORs or certain airports. That indicates it's part of a minimum operational network of VORs and instrument approaches that don't rely on GPS. But by and large, this is the way the world is going because it's so much cheaper, extremely effective, and it allows for these things uh, direct routings that we would never be able to do if you needed to rely on a line of sight navigation like VOR navigation. Yeah, very good point, Seven. Thank you. So uh, the, the basis of the RNAV is the waypoint. Uh, it's the key component of the RNAV. It is a geographical position that is defined in terms of latitude and longitude or latin long. Uh, simply put, it's a point in space somewhere above the Earth that we define. Uh, we can associate it with either existing nav aids, intersections, or fixes, such as, uh, for example, BOSOX is a fix. Here you can see it's uh, defined as a radial off of one VOR and then 30 DME from another. Or we can have an RNAV waypoint, for example, in this case, Rongi. And there are two types of RNAV waypoints. First, you can have the flyby uh, that is not circled on charts. You can begin your turn prior to reaching the waypoint, quote unquote, turn anticipation, or the fly over that is circled on these charts. You can see alpha there is circled, where you fly over the waypoint and then begin the turn towards the next one. And remember, at any point, feel free to ask questions in the chat. RNAV is available in all phases of flight. For example, you can have SIDS or standard instrument departures. 
Uh, we'll talk about those in a second. And here is the Highland 3 out of Boston. It's uh, quite prevalent en route. You'll have low RNAV airways, which begin with a T as in Tango, high RNAV airways, which are Q as in Quebec, and then direct two, for example, uh, in that flight plan, you can see the airplane's going from Ash and direct Bagel. No airways needed. And then we have standard terminal arrival routes, or STARS. Those will be the uh, main topic of tonight's discussion. So they transition you from the en route environment to the instrument approach, which, of course, also can have RNAV. Two main types. We're not going to be touching on those too much tonight, but you also have uh, RNAV RNP and then RNAV GPS. And just having a look at the pictures there, it's really neat to see what the world of RNAV has opened up for us in terms of instrument approaches. So if you look at that example on the left, the RNP into Newark replaced an old visual approach that is actually still used as stadium visual. And it allows for this precise navigation around an area of extreme noise sensitivity and extreme traffic. You've got people landing at LaGuardia right next door. So being able to have this routing pre-established where airplanes can fly it directly is of course a really advantageous tool for ATC. And then on the far right here, we have an example of an RNAV track that's taking you straight through a valley. And so something you could never do with a standard ILS where you need that curve to get yourself into the valley, RNAV has totally opened up approaches at airports where otherwise they would have just been VFR only several years ago. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, It really is, RNAV really is the future. I'd say so, at least. Now, when you fly on RNAV, uh, you need to have an appropriately certified aircraft. That means you can have an appropriately certified GPS that is TSO-owned under 196. Uh, don't worry about what that means. Basically, the GPS has to be certified. And they use global navigation satellite systems, um, and these are considered RNAV. GNSS, as it's called, is the backbone of the modern flight management system, or FMS, or flight computer, or FMC, uh, that you would use in almost every airliner. Some older RNAV units use VOR DME ground stations, technically considered RNAV, but are much more limited in capability. Example, if you have a level T Boeing 767. On the left, you will see a Garmin GPS 500 GPS uh, that comes stock with flight simulator and P3D. You can see the direct to CRAN waypoint, uh, that's RNAV. And on the right, you'll see a 737 flight management system um, that is basically entirely reliant on RNAV, and I believe that's the PMDG one. Yeah, which would be a GPS-based system. Yeah. And these are giving you an idea of what the range of availability is. A big part of RNAV capability in the simulation world is what airplane are you flying? And by and large, most default flight simulators, including FSX, P3D, and even the new Microsoft Flight Simulator, and maybe to less of an extent, but still a little bit, even X-Plane, you have very limited capability to truly fly RNAV procedures with a default aircraft, especially to fly a complex a descend via STAR or one of the RNP approaches. You really need an add-on aircraft. So in X-Plane, that might be the Zebo mod. In FSX P3D, that might be the most recent version of the 737 NGX from PMDG, hopefully to be released for Flight Simulator 2021 day, and a whole lot of other add-on available type tools, including GPSs that you can buy, both physical units and software units that'll give you a significant upgrade over what this default FSX GPS does, which is basically nothing. Yeah, I remember that GPS really didn't uh, help us out much when we were learning to fly, but um, the PMDG airliner, uh, very, very good add-on with a very, very accurate RNAV uh, FMZ. We're going to talk about navigation data and add on aircraft upgrades in a second but one of the things we were discussing as we were just getting set to begin this seminar tonight is the importance of having an airplane that can actually do the kinds of things that you want not everyone has the ability to fly a complex add-on and so if you still want to fly into boston keep in mind that nothing requires you to fly rnav most of the airports around the United States still maintain a set of conventional arrivals. At Boston, we have the Norwich arrival and we have the Gardner arrival, both from the west side of the airport. So if you're flying in an airplane that doesn't have VNAV or you're flying in an older airplane without navigation data, feel free to file and fly those older procedures. That's really what they are there for. And it'll allow you to have an experience that actually matches your capabilities. That being said, we're also seeing plenty of areas that are doing away with their conventional navigation. So Boston no longer has a SCUP arrival. That was the old conventional arrival from the Northeast off the ocean. Now there's just an Ocean 5 and it's an RNAV only procedure. If you're in a 747 that doesn't have RNAV, which there are some of in the flight sim world. Yeah, the older I've, one's like 200 and older. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, and then in Rilla too, yeah. Unfortunately, there is no 
version of that ocean arrival you can fly. Many airports too, Cleveland, Detroit, have taken away their conventional stars. So now we have special flight sim only routings for non RNAV aircraft because the majority of the operations happening in there in the real world are totally RNAV capable. So I want to point out that we're going to talk a lot about RNAV tonight. And by all means, we encourage you to try your best. But if you're in an airplane that can't do it, don't be afraid to just file that conventional arrival or file a route that will work for you with your capabilities. Because at the end of the day, you really won't have a great experience if you're trying to fly a default MSFS or FSX airplane in the RNAV world. It really just doesn't work. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Navigation data, as we just mentioned. Current nav data is a requirement for flying RNAV procedures. Uh, Ground-based stations like VORs do not change from month to month, but on Fort Well, by and large, but RNAV does. Uh, you can have uh, waypoints called and procedures are updated on the every 28-day cycle called an ARAC. The current uh, ARAC cycle is uh, 2010 with 20 being the uh, 2020 year and 10 being the 10th ARAC cycle of the year. And it's current until October of 2020. Updating your ARAC depends on what RNAV equipment you use and whatever add-on you get. If it has uh, RNAV, will probably come with documentation saying how to actually update it. A free ARAC update every three months comes from that French website. And a payware updates uh, each cycle for many popular add-on slash FMS aircraft like Navigraph.com. Uh, that is basically the standard flight sim everybody uses, Navigraph. You can visit the note. Go ahead. I was going to say Navigraph's a great subscription because you have the ability to update everything more or less. So if you're flying X-Plane, you can update the nav data in the entire simulator. If you're flying the NGX, you can update your nav data in that. And for the same subscription, you can update the Aerosoft A320. So anytime that you're flying any of these complex add-on aircraft that you might have spent 80 or $90 on, that is only as good as the navigation database in there, which is probably from several months ago. It's always a good idea to just pay that Navigraph subscription. It's really not much, and the benefit is that you can fly up-to-date, accurate navigation procedures all the way through your journeys. And as a comment is just being made here in the sim, Navigraph also links into sites like SimBrief, so you can even update the planning software that you're using to set up your flights. It's really a great system, and Navigraph's actually been quite supportive of VVA and Flights Max over the years, so would strongly encourage people who are looking for nav data updates to consider that. But of course, there is also the free version that's available, and with a little bit more work, I'm sure you can find ways to plug that into the NGX too if you really, really wanted to. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how that would be possible. My strong recommendation is just to get Navigraph because you can literally do a one-click update for every single one of your add-ons. Yeah. Now you can visit the NOTAM section of our forums for more info on this, and uh, you can click that link right there. And note that you are required to file an equipment suffix. Um, so that uh, is something that uh, quite often gets gets uh, incorrectly filed on the network, and it is important, contrary to popular belief. It's a way of telling the controller what data and capabilities you have. Example, the 737 Slant Lima, that tells us you are fully RNAV capable with RVSM capability, and we talked about RVSM in a previous ground school. The Baron 58 Slant Golf tells us you are GPS capable without RVSM capability. So a lot of people gloss over that equipment suffix section or just leave it as the default, and I would uh, encourage you to not do so. Um, as a uh, knowledgeable simulator pilot, you should be filing that section with the relevant equipment suffix to your aircraft. It will make I'm controller's just, life much easier. Absolutely, and I'm just copying and pasting a link in that will allow you to very quickly decide which equipment suffix makes sense for your aircraft. So you can feel free to use that suffix selector .com. Now, of course, there is also the move toward ICAO flight planning. That happens in the US in real life now for all IFR flights, and VATSIM is very slowly dragging itself, kicking and screaming into the modern century with ICAO flight planning as well. So some sites like SimBrief now allow you to file through an ICAO system. And instead of actually filing an equipment suffix, you actually file a series of capabilities that tell us even more detail what you can and can't do. But that being said, if you're still flying a V pilot you're using that to file or X pilot to file flight plans, you'll see that equipment suffix field. So either way, providing information to the controllers is important. And if you're using out of date navigation data, even just a simple remark in your flight plan, you know, no SIDs, no stars, or outdated navigation data, that's really helpful for us to be aware of what you can and can't do. 
Yeah, absolutely right. Um, in fact, I believe that there is no such thing uh, domestically anymore uh, as filing an FAA flight plan. Mm -hmm. All of the uh, all of the flight plans that I filed in real life through Four Flight has just been ICAO. Yep. All right. How do we identify the RNAV procedure? Well, this is actually pretty easy. It'll say RNAV on it. RNAV procedures will have RNAV listed as part of the procedure name. And if an airport has an RNAV set in the start, it'll also have a corresponding conventional procedure just to those aircraft that we just talked about that are unable to fly the RNAV based on uh, aircraft equipment. Example, you'll see that the uh, Roebuck 3, the Ocean 5, the J-12 are RNAV arrivals. Um, and each has a corresponding non-RNAV one. You've got the Wounds 2 and uh, the Norwich 7 that correspond to the Roebuck, and you have the Gardner 4 that corresponds to the J-Fund. And now let's talk about a comparison between uh, two of these uh, uh, linked, so to speak, arrivals, one RNAV, one RNAV. They're both going into Kennedy. This one's the Rober 1. You'll see this is a non-RNAV arrival. It doesn't have RNAV listed anywhere on the plate. And uh, you'll notice that those two red squares, um, they denote navigation from VOR to VOR. So you're going from Kennebunk to Aspen, which is identified by a cross radial, to Trait, also a cross radial, to uh, Parch and Hampton, and then Rober and Kennedy, and so on and so forth. Uh, you are literally tracking VOR to VOR. Just for clarity, it's Parch to Calverton, and then down to Rober. Hampton is just there for some identification. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I misread the chart. Yeah. Um, I'm a bad flight instructor. Parch to Calverton <laughs> to Rober to Kennedy. But uh, I did. Uh, you can see why it could get confusing, right? I just misread the chart. Uh, Hampton is actually the VOR used for the cross radial to both Rober and Parch. And then you have the Parch 1 arrival. You'll see that it says RNAV on both the top and the bottom of the flight. There is a note on the bottom of the plate uh, in one of the notes that says radar required. I'm sorry, radar required, RNAV 1, and GPS required. Or dual DMEs and IRU, but you would never use those. It's just GPS. Um, and then we can talk about the uh, last final square. You'll see no cross radials at all. And that uh, RNAV, uh, in contrast to the Rover 1, the Rover 1 ends at Kennedy. So you overfly the Kennedy airport the Kennedy VOR, full stop, you are going to be doing something after that according to air traffic control. On the Parch one, it actually breaks off at Rober, and one track heads to Kennedy, the other to Caput, depending on what runway you are landing. Now, a very fun fact is that stars can provide both vertical and lateral guidance. Uh, the vertical bars, uh, they identify the difference uh, between crossing at or above and at or below altitudes. So you'll see here that uh, Calverton, for example, uh, it's got vertical bars at 12,000. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's got uh, 12,000 in between those two horizontal bars, meaning you are crossing, expecting to cross Calverton at 12,250 knots. The uh, Eagle 6, for example, um, has a bunch of those. You'll see every single waypoint on there uh, has some sort of vertical crossing restriction. Take bot Botox, sure, Botox, Botox, let's go with Botox. Take Botox, for example, that says at or above 13,000, at or below 14,000. So they're giving you a 1,000 foot window to cross Botox. And then compare that to the waypoint before Homer, where you have to cross below 17,000 because the bar is above it. But there is no altitude that's a minimum there. So realistically, it may seem like, okay, I can just cross Homer at 11,000. But no, the Botox restriction applies as well. So effectively, I have to be at or below 17,000 at Homer and at least no lower than 13,000 when I cross it so that I can meet the next restriction as well. Similarly, down at Basil at the very bottom right, we have an at or above restriction showing that that waypoint has no top limit. You simply have to be above 6,000. But again, you will have had to meet the SD restriction of 10,000 before that. And speeds work the same way. So here, all the speed restrictions are showing that we're going to cross that particular waypoint at the published speed, but they could also be set up for a at or above or at or below using that same concept with the bars being either on both sides of the required restriction above or below to donate the appropriate crossing altitude or speed. Very good points. Uh, let's pause here. Does anybody have any questions so far? Paste them in the chat if you do. 
Okay, seeing none, we can move into phraseology that's associated with RNAV procedures. And there's a couple new phraseology uh, bits that you will hear on the network. The, uh, the most common one is descend via. So descend via, uh, if you want to change the slide, Evan. Yeah, I think we'll just, just talk briefly before we do that about the difference here between the expect and then the published altitudes of yeah, the sure. arrival. So um, let's talk about the expect ones. Uh, if you look at the left side, you will see both for trait, which is non-highlighted, and Calverton, which is highlighted, there are no hard altitudes, so to speak. It's expect trait at flight level 240, expect Calverton at 12,250 knots. That is not a hard altitude. You will not be issued a descent via. You will be explicitly told to maintain those, but that is included on the chart for situational awareness, and you should plug them into your flight management computer, because that's 99 out of 100 times that is what you're going to get. Con, uh, contrast that to the Eagle arrival, where that's not an expect. If you are cleared to descend via the Eagle arrival, you are crossing Botox between 13 and 14, Homer below 17, Gino between 11 and 12. So, so one, you have to be explicitly told, sorry, you have to be explicitly told for Calverton and Trait. You do not have to be explicitly told for the Eagle 6 arrival. And the important thing to remember is, regardless of which star you're on and whether it's a descent via or not, you will always get an altitude clearance. So you may never leave a cleared altitude until you've been given some kind of altitude clearance. That could take the form of descent and maintain flight level 240. That could take the form of cross trait at a maintain flight level 240. Or it could take the form of descend via the Eagle 6 arrival. But until you hear one of those things, even if you hit your top of descent, even if your FMS is saying, hey, it's time to go down, we still need to get a clearance from ATC before we leave our last assigned altitude. That's a very common thing we see on the network. Pilots will hit their top of descent and say, okay, I guess it's time to go down. And they start descending right into some traffic underneath them. So if you're approaching your top of descent, you haven't heard anything, by all means, feel free to query ATC and see what's going on. The trait crossing is actually a good example of this. That trait crossing is there because when we're super busy and we have five or six controllers online, that represents an ATC boundary between our sectors. But for the rest of the time, when we just have a single Boston center, we really don't care about that restriction. It doesn't help us with traffic most of the time. It really is just for sectorization. And so if I'm working Boston center top down, I'm probably not going to deal with that. I'm just going to tell you to cross Calverton at 12,250 knots. And if you're at 33,000, it's trade. It doesn't bother me. So you may be thinking, well, my FMS is saying it's time to go down. But in fact, I'm thinking you've got lots of time. So again, feel free to query us and ask that question. If you're getting concerned that you're hitting your top altitude or your top of descent, it's time to go down. By all means, we're happy to help. And I'll yeah, just point a, out one more piece. Sorry, Alec, go ahead. I, I was just going to reiterate, that's a very good point uh, and should be really applied to most instructions. If, if you are unsure or your airplane is telling you one thing and you haven't heard what you expect from air traffic control, please just ask before just doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give the folks in the chat here a chance to answer, but there's a 2300 altitude that's uh, highlighted now on the slide here with the Parch 1. There's some similar examples on the Eagle. What does that altitude represent, that 2300? Is that something we need to be worried about in terms of an altitude that we need to meet or a crossing restriction? What does that 2300 represent for people in the chat? Minimum in route altitude. Nice. I got one. Even via voice, even better. So MEA, Marcus, tell us about what that is. Uh, it's the minimum that the controller is going to have you go along that path because that's going to give you obstacle clearance as well as radar help. Good. And an important thing to think about with that, this is another thing we see sometimes. Pilots will see that altitude and think, oh, I have to descend to 2300 here. No, that's absolutely not what that's about. It's As Marcus says, it's situational awareness for you. It's the knowledge that that's the safest altitude that you can descend to and still have terrain clearance and be able to communicate with ATC. So if we look at the arrival for the Eagle 6, where those MEAs are a little bit higher because we're dealing with some of the higher elevations underneath the arrival here, if this 10,000, you might think, okay, well, I cross Botox between 14 and 13, then I descend to 10, but that's absolutely not correct. And in fact, as you can see here, the waypoint Gino has a restriction of 11,000 or above. So that 10,000 is there for your situational awareness. It might be something that you'd consider in the event of an engine failure where you can't maintain one two thousand, for example, but it's not something that we need to be descending to meet on a regular basis. It's just there for awareness. So we wanted to point that out as well as a common thing that comes up from time to time. Very good point. 
And now we can talk about uh, stars that can provide both vertical and lateral guidance. You can see an airplane here descending via the Eagle 6 arrival. So the idea here is unlike on that arrival we were talking about into JFK, when you get a clearance to descend via the arrival, you're following the lateral portion, but simultaneously you're also descending, meeting those published crossing restrictions. And unlike cross Calverton at 1, 2,000 and 250 knots, you're simply going to get a single descend via instruction that makes all of those altitudes become required. And you'll use your FMS, your VNAV, or heck, you might even just use some mental math and find your way to navigate down to each of those waypoints. There is a question on the chat in the chat about what the star over an MEA is. So Evan, if you can go back to the part one. Yeah, so it's that one right there. Uh, yeah, it's that one and then the one right above parch. Um, I'm struggling to remember if that's RNAV or the Oro or the uh, Mocha. Okay. I believe that's the Mocha. Yeah, yeah. So that's the that's not actually an MEA. That's technically a Mocha minimum obstacle clearance altitude. Does not guarantee any navigation reception in that sector, but it does, or uh, at least within tw with it uh, outside of 22 miles of the VOR. But it does guarantee uh, obstacle clearance. So again, not something you'd be using really outside of an emergency. And in this particular example, it's hard to envision a time that you could maintain 1,400 and not also maintain 3,000. But if you look at some of the higher elevation areas, some of the places where we have terrain that's at three or 4,000 feet, that might mean that the radio reception is 8,000, but actually you could be safe from the terrain at five. And so as we say, you'll be guaranteed terrain clearance, but you may not necessarily be able to track a VOR or be able to communicate with ATC. And when there is no asterisk, the altitude for the MEA and the MOCA are the same. And that's the case in any of the RNAV procedures because of course, we're not dealing with trying to track a VOR radial when it's RNAV. And we talked about the airplane descending, and now we can talk about phraseology associated with RNAV procedures. So first, we have the descend via. Uh, that is the most standard one that you will hear. Um, that one is, well, it's pretty standard. It just clears you to descend via the arrival and following all the published uh, speed and altitude restrictions, such as Monster Seats, Dubal, JFund, and all, all those you can see in the bars, um, as well as following the arrival uh, laterally. So that one clears you for both laterally and vertically down the arrival. Then you have proceed via, which just clears you via the lateral portions of the arrival, and you will be given a separate altitude instruction. And you can see, uh, then you have the landing west or the runway 27, and that specifies with a transition, which we will talk about in just about a uh, couple more seconds here. Um, the transition actually takes you from the arrival to the in instrument approach. Um, so you can see that this arrival branches off after reservoir. Um, and depending on what runway you're going, you'll be following a different uh, quote unquote off ramp off of the highway to the side street. That's a good analogy. So up until Quabbin um, and really up until reservoir, you're following the same arrival with every other airplane. After reservoir, you're branching off to whatever runway uh, is currently uh, in use or whatever runway you're landing on. So for example, if you might hear, if you're over true is and you hear descend via the JFUN 2 arrival runway 27. That means you follow all of the restrictions up until a reservoir, then you head to Mystic, and then you turn left, head to Revere, and then head to Fake. And you follow those, um, and you, you follow those exact instructions. And that's all in the uh, textual depiction as well. Um, a really big thing I want to note here is what you do after Fake. A lot of pilots will just say, oh, um, well, I'm done with fake. It's a flyover waypoint. Time to turn right and tur uh, get onto the base leg for the ILS-27. And that is not the case. Um, after fake, you see uh, the textual descriptions and as well as the arrow say, then on track 0, 09 or 4, expect radar vectors to final approach course. Meaning, you fly from revere to fake, assuming you have not heard anything else from air traffic control. You keep on chugging on that 0, 09 or 4 heading until you hear something. And if it's been a while or you're unsure, just ask. Some of the FMSs in a few of the island aircraft incorrectly will 
line you up from fake, and then they just take you direct to the initial approach fix for the ILS. They're not supposed to do that. There's supposed to be what's called a discontinuity there, so that the airplane just keeps on flying on that 094 track, as is described by the description. But there are a couple of airplanes that incorrectly will simply sequence the initial approach fix claim in this example for runway 27. And so we're in the middle of an FNO or a busy event. There are 12 airplanes on the final approach course, and somebody crosses fake and follows the airplane and turns right into that line of 12 airplanes. I've had that happen to me on final. I probably Alec has as well. And you Absolutely. Can the, the outcome of that when we have to pull every one of those 12 airplanes off the arrival for the one person who accidentally made that turn. So It is uh, very irritating at best. Yeah, no kidding. So definitely want to make sure when we are following these tracks that we continue as they are published. I should clarify as well, people might be looking for the Quabin 3. We've got some older procedures in this slideshow because they're just as relevant. And in fact, in some cases, they exemplify what we're talking about a little better than the current ones. So you won't find the Quabin 3. It's now become the J-Fund arrival. But for those of us who have been around as long as I have, we'll have fond memories of the old Quabin arrival and the Cran arrival, which you're going to see in a little while. Okay, any and other yes, questions uh, on this? Go yeah, ahead, question um. about runway 27 transition. So like, exactly, Jeff. Um, and you'll hear some different phraseology here. So at some airports like Boston, our phraseology is to send via the J-Fund to arrival runway 27. At other airports, you'll hear to send via the J-Fund to arrival runway 22 left transition or runway 27 transition. That's the same thing. It's referencing the transition. So the part from Quabbin down to fake in this case is actually the runway 27 transition as opposed to the portion to the left of Quabin. If I bring this uh, slide back a little bit here, the portion to the left of Quabin just being the actual arrival itself. There are also, confusingly, transitions that get you onto the arrival, so on deck and wait, for example. Uh, but when we talk about a runway transition, the runway transition is from the right of that red line that I've got drawn on the screen right now. You'll also have some airports where there are parallel runways, and so instead of Descend via the Quavin 3 arrival runway 27, you might hear descend via the arrival landing west. That means that you'll be landing for any of the west parallel runways. So at an airport like Minneapolis, you might hear that kind of thing where you'll actually be given a direction as opposed to a specific runway. And that just means you've got to figure out that you'll be landing on one of those multiple parallel runways, but you don't necessarily know which one. Yeah, you can use that. At, I'll take the example of Atlanta because that's where I'm right now. Atlanta has four runway, uh, five runways actually. All of them are east and west. So um, that's mo mostly for initial descent planning. Uh, so quite a ways out from the airport, you'll be told landing west or landing east, meaning you have to start descending soon or you have a little time to wait. All righty. Uh, any gift there? And we talked about that. All right. Let's talk about some important reminders. Remember. Regardless of any instructions or clearance, speed restrictions are required unless they are specifically canceled. For example, you'll hear on a pretty calm night, for example, uh, JetBlue 1885 descend via the Robic 3 arrival, runway 4 right, uh, delete speed restrictions. Unless you are specifically told delete speed restrictions or anything else, you are required to fly those as well. And that's even true if you don't get a descend via. So just by flying the Roebuck arrival, even if you haven't been told to descend via, even if the altitudes don't apply, the speeds are always applicable unless they're specifically canceled or you've been told to maintain a different speed. Now, some descent instructions. Uh, you'll see Banky there that uh, says 16,000 uh, at or above 16 and at 270 knots. So that's an example of the speed restriction we saw. <clears throat> Do not descend until you're clear to. So, for example, descend and maintain, cross, and descend via are all applicable descent restrictions. But again, as we mentioned earlier, let's say you uh, are at merit and your FMC says time to descend. Don't just hit the descend button. You actually got to wait or uh, ask air traffic control. Now, descend and maintain or cross those two clearances, they will cancel any vertical profile on the plate. So let's say you're somewhere southwest of our little diagram here, right there and you are told to, uh, let's say, descend and maintain 17,000. You do, does not matter what you cross Vex or Giggity at. All, all that uh, matters is that you cross, uh, you descend down 17,000. Then, let's say you're told descend via again. Let's say you're told cross above 16,000, then descend via the Robic 3 arrival. Um, 
anything up to Banky doesn't matter as long as you hit 16,000 when you're at Banky. And after Banky, uh, you do have to resume any applicable uh, arrival speeds and altitudes. Now, when you comply with the descent via, you first descend, then reduce speed to meet restrictions because we know that it's difficult. So uh, we know that airplanes like to descend, airplanes like to lose speed, but they don't like to do both at the same time. That is basic, well, basic physics and energy management. Uh, so given one or the other, when you're complying with the descent via, descend first, then reduce your speed. And we talked about the MEA, which is the minimum honor altitude. They are not part of the procedure and are not authorized by descent via. Those are used in emergencies only. And lastly, should you have any questions or you're unsure or unclear about something, please just ask air traffic control. Now, let's actually talk about the fun example. We're going to be flying the Aerobic One arrival into Boston from JFK. Quite a ways out, your first step is to program the arrival and the transition. So basically using the TAF and the estimated runway to use. Uh, so for example, here you've got the Boston meter. It's uh, showing wind 010 at 16 gust 25. Based off of that knowledge, you'd probably be getting runway 4 right at Boston. So that's what you select. You select robot 1 4 right in the FMC. This is the PMDG 737. Then in the arrivals page, you select robot 1 for right with the JFK transition. I want to talk about this. This is a really, we talked about it last week as well with Krikor, but it's something we get all the time. Pilots love to ask the question, what runway is active when you assign them a star clearance? And many times we won't know the answer to that. So if it's Boston, I probably know what runway we're landing, but we'll regularly be sequencing airplanes into Kennedy. And I'll have people who have just come in off the ocean that are still in Canada asking me what the active runway is at JFK. And I have absolutely no idea what's going on at JFK most of the time. So it really doesn't help anybody to ask that question. The reality is you have to do a little bit of guesswork. So if you can get the ATIS, if you're within range, certainly that helps. You can also double click on the ATIS in most, most pilot clients. That will have give you a textual ATIS. You can even use VATSPY or CuteScoop, and you can sometimes access the textual ATIS there. So there's lots of ways to figure out what they're landing, but of course that can change. And if you're programming your airplane three hours from the airport, there's a good chance that by the time you get there, it may not be active anymore. So the best thing to do, even better than the ATIS, is look at the TAF. Go pull up the expected runway, or the expected wind, excuse me, for the airport. And then based on that, once you have some local knowledge, you'll kind of have a good sense as to what you're doing. And again, using this example, we've picked the Roebuck 1 runway 4 right, at this particular situation, we're coming in via the Kennedy transition, so we've selected that. Some airplanes, airplanes will even make you select the approach at this point. Again, you're making your best estimate with the knowledge that should you end up getting a different clearance, like descend via for runway 22 left, you'll just have to reprogram the airplane. It takes all of two minutes to do that. You'll have to live with it. Yeah, good points. And if you're flying into Atlanta, get prepared to change it about three times on every arrival. Yeah. They only have five fun ways for you to worry about. Exactly. Now, a second step is, well, to follow air traffic control instructions and descend to only one instructed, right? I understand we're eager to get down, but no need to be descending down to 200 when you are hundreds of miles away from the airport. Um, and oftentimes, actually, airplanes will calculate descent profiles wrong. So if you're ever unsure, just ask. That's the moral of tonight. So uh, American 1, proceed direct Banky, descend and maintain flight level 190. Question, do we now have to cross FEX at 230? Feel free to just post in the chat with your yes or no answers. Matt says yes. And a bunch of people saying no, some more people saying yes. And the correct answer is actually no, you don't. Well, why is that? Present position, you were told to go direct Banky. That removes FEX from your flight plan. So you are no longer overflying FEX. And if you are, it is purely by coincidence and that it should not be on your flight plan anymore. Therefore, you don't have to cross it at 230 because it's largely non-existent to you. And as you say, Alec, even if there was no direct banky, even if they said fly the route over fax, but the instruction was to set and maintain flight level one nine or zero, those magic words to set and maintain officially cancel any of the altitudes that would be between you and nineteen thousand. So 
all of a sudden that 230 doesn't apply. This is another great example of an altitude that's purely there for sectorization. The FX waypoint is the differentiator between a high sector of Boston Center and a low sector of Boston Center. The only reason that is there is because when both of those sectors are staffed, we want you to enter the low sector at that point. If we're working 134.7 in a combined airspace, I really don't care what altitude you cross FX at because you're going to be talking to me the whole time. So most of the time when I'm working, you can expect me to give you direct pro V and to send a maintain level 230. Whenever you hit 230, doesn't matter to me. You want to stay high? Great. Stay high and go fast. But again, what we are going to do is dependent on what the instruction we get actually is. Descend and maintain. And if, in this case, we're clear direct. So we're going to put Banky up at the top. Make sure we keep the altitude of Banky because that still may be applicable. And for now, since we're clear to descend and maintain flight level 1900, we just dial that into the MCP or the autopilot. Hit the vertical speed or flight level change mode if you prefer and start on down without having to worry about that 230 restriction effects. Yeah, so if you're told drag bank, you remove FEX and Giggity and all in from your flight plan. Now up next, uh, your next task is to... Uh, uh, sorry, just a quick question from the uh, from the chat. So Matt asks, with the clearance being to set and maintain flight level 190, does that change Banky? The answer is not really. Uh, so Banky is still there at or above 16,000. That restriction may apply or it may not. We don't know yet. The only thing that will make that restriction apply is if later on you get the clearance to descend via the arrival. If descend via comes into play, now the 16,000 becomes required. Alternatively, the next instruction might be to set and maintain 11,000, in which case the banky at 16,000 doesn't matter. So in order for us to be ready to do either one of those things, we would leave the 16,000 or above in the FMS, as you see in the picture here. That way we're ready if we get a descend via clearance. And if we do not get that clearance, we just get told to descend and maintain something, then we can deal with that manually. Um, here in this particular 737 example, we've just done this with vertical speed. There are airplanes that allow you to do what's called a vertical direct to, where you can program the nav data, you could delete the altitude restrictions. There's all kinds of ways to do it, depending on your airplane. How do we know if it is at or above or at or below? Good question, that is depending on the bars here. For example, uh, take a look at FEX. FEX is at flight level 230 because it has bars surrounding it on both sides. Then you look at Banky and you see how the bar is below 16,000. Uh, the opposite of that is above. So a better way to think about it, 16,000 is above the bar. So you should be crossing Banky at or above 16,000. And then if the bar was actually above Banky, you'd be crossing Banky at or below 16,000. Does that make sense? So you fly to Banky. Um, your now job is to wait for the assignment of the runway transition, and you will see that's on the second page. That's all after a roebuck. And remember, a lot of these arrivals, departures as well, have multiple pages. One of the biggest mistakes you'll make is looking at page one and not looking at page two, or in the case of the roebuck arrival, there's even a page three. So whenever we're given a clearance for an arrival, have a look at all the applicable pages. Make sure you're familiar with where the instructions are because there'll often be important notes that might be on that second or even third page. In this case, the initial portion of the arrival is in the first page, but the actual runway transitions are on the second page. And so in a moment, when we hear the descend via clearance with the runway, it's the second page and the waypoints that are there that matter to us. So then after you are assigned your runway transition uh, from Roebuck, uh, in this case, looks like it's going to 2.7, or uh, not sure. You follow the vertical profile once you're given the descent via. Here, for example, descend via the Roebuck front one arrival, runway 2.7. Excellent. Reprogram the FMS with that runway and uh, set uh, LNAV, nav. Keep on chugging over Cran, Ansley, Cradle, Kleb. And then hawk do. So the key here is we got the descend via clearance. So first of all, we need to make sure we've now changed our transition. We originally programmed four, right? Oh, turns out ATC changed it on us. It's runway two seven. So very quickly, we're going to go and start 
typing away to change the arrival in the FMS to runway 27. And now we got the descent via clearance. We're going to use the VNAV mode to actually make sure we meet all these restrictions. And as you can see, cross-referencing the chart to the actual picture of the FMS here, every time there's a restriction on the chart, it matches the FMS. So Ansley is at or above 8,000. In the FMS, we see at or above 8,000. The next waypoint is Cleb, where it's at 8,000 and 250 knots. That's there in the FMS as well. Hawk is next, 5,210 knots. That's in the FMS as well. Part of the check that we'll do, and we talked about this last time during our briefings, is we're going to cross-reference that. So as we get the clearance to descend via, and probably even before that, we will have gone through and actually looked at the chart and said, all right, here are the five or six waypoints for runway 27. Here are the altitudes that are associated with them. Let's make sure that that's actually there in the FMS. One of the things that we see 25, 30% maybe of pilots doing at Boston is we'll give a clearance to descend via for a runway and they don't fly the correct transition. We've told them to go to runway 27 but they go to runway four right. It happens all the time. And it's a real problem for us when we're trying to sequence airplanes in a line because if the middle one of the line turns the wrong way, now everyone behind that person is going to be messed up. So really important that when you get a descend via clearance, that you have a look at the chart and you look at the runway that you're instructed to descend via four and do that cross check. Are the waypoints in my FMS the same as the waypoints on the chart? And as always, if the sim doesn't actually work properly, if the waypoints that you see in your airplane don't match, or if you're not sure, just tell us, hey, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm not getting the same waypoints. I'm unable to fly there on my 27 transition. I'm having some trouble with my navigation. Could I please get vectors? We were really, really happy to give you a heading and an altitude if it means you're not going to make a left turn into the traffic that is about to depart from the airport and cause a massive headache for all of us. So please, please, please do that moment of cross-checking and make sure that your airplane and your chart match with the clearance you've been given. Yeah, I, 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 couldn't, I, couldn't have, uh, <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better than myself. It is very important. The reason we stress that in the, in the, in the so much is because it really does matter. Um, Cross-checking is something easy and can save both you and the controller mountains of headache. Now you follow the lateral guidance until you are given further instructions. After Hogadu in this case... You'll notice it says expect radar vectors to final approach course on track 025. So after hop two, just keep on chugging on track 025 until you get radar vectors from air traffic control. So let's put it all together here and kind of do a nice review of what we've just seen. So we're looking at the Roebuck 1, which is now the Roebuck 3, but it's just a number from JFK. Start out, program the arrival and the transition using the TAF, estimate the runway, figure out what we expect to see. And of course, program the airplane to do that cross check. Then follow ATC instructions, descend when they tell us to descend. Don't leave a cleared altitude until we get a descend via, a descend to maintain, or a descend, sorry, or a crossing restriction at some point along the way. If we haven't been given an assignment of the runway transition, we'll be patient. We're not going to be asking Washington Center what runway can I expect at Boston because they have no idea. They probably don't even know what runway they're landing in Washington, depending on which sector they're working. Wait for that assignment to come. You'll be told to descend via. As always, if you're getting close to the point where you need to know, which in this particular example is Roebuck, feel free to ask. But you'll be told that in these days, especially well back of Roebuck, probably even back of FEX, you'll be given a runway transition. Once you've got that transition, double check and make sure that the waypoints in your FMS is matching up with what you see on the chart. If you need to, reprogram as you might be required, and then follow the vertical profile when you're told to descend via the arrival. And most importantly, at the end of all this, when you hit Hawk Do at 5,210 knots, follow the instructions. Don't turn for the ILS. Don't turn in the way of that line of airplanes that are set up for Boston. Continue flying in this example on that 025 track and wait for vectors from ATC. Very, very good on that, Evan. Very thorough. Does anybody have any questions on what we have covered tonight? Okay. I guess not. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, attending Boston Virtual RTAC Drone School. Uh, this was designed to help uh, all of you guys in all skill levels share your knowledge and experience with members. Um, tonight was the conclusion of the 2020 Ground School, and 
with that said, as much as we will miss seeing guys every Monday, uh, you are encouraged to find recordings of each of these seminars, including tonight's on the BVA YouTube channel. And we will most likely run another ground school um, every uh, every two years or so, so about two years from now. I really uh, want to just take a moment to thank both Alec and Krikor. These are both young guys, CFIs. Both of them are in college. They've got crazy busy schedules dealing with studies, exams, and then in some cases actually flight training at the same time. So we really appreciate the time that they have taken to share their knowledge and their experience. It's one thing to hear me, who doesn't really know anything about flying, talking about this stuff and giving the virtual ATC perspective, but I think it's really nice to be able to hear from people like Alec and Krikor who train this stuff in real life all the time, who are training their students in much the same way as they're training you. So thank you guys both for taking the time to be part of this ground school. And thanks to those of you who've participated with us all the way through from several weeks ago when we started with radio communications. It's been a lot of fun. And as Alex says, encourage you to check us out on YouTube where you can find recordings of all of these seminars. And those will be the ones you get to watch for the next two years until we run this again. Thanks everyone for being part of tonight's session. All the best. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Evan.